this is a, a work in progress, correct, Emily? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> so Emily was good, uh, good to um, uh, provide Sarah and Paul um, drafts of her various chapters. And uh, this is a book that is uh, coming together. Um, and um, this is a good point at which uh, Emily can receive feedback and comments. So this is exactly what I was hoping for in terms of getting a, uh, a book manuscript at, uh, you know, the proper, the proper point in its inception. So um, the title of the, of the book, the working title of the book is Empire, Empire is Succession, Trusteeship, Capitalism, and Native American Dispossession in the United States. And this is Emily Conley from Brandeis University. And I suggested to Emily that she take about 40 minutes to present whatever aspects of the book she wants to, to uh, uh, present. And then we turn it over to two discussants, Paul Freimer from Princeton and Sarah Quinn from Washington. So as I, as I was happy to take credit for, we've got a historian presenting her book manuscript and we've got a political scientist and a sociologist as dis, as discussant. So in, in today's academic world, I'm I'm looking pretty good in the in the provost size, right? Being very interdisciplinary. Again, thank you so much, Jeff, for organizing this. Um, I'll, I'll you know I'm beaming out to you today from uh, Nipmuc in Massachusetts land. I teach at Brandeis University. Um, I'm coming really into this project as uh, or into this um, symposium as somebody who works uh, kind of on the political economy of the West from the vantage point of Native people who were being dispossessed for a lot of the kind of processes and sort of developments that we associate um, kind of as occurring after that fact. Part of my work um, and sort of I'm trying to use the terms that I've been learning today with uh, your, your methodology, but kind of the motivation is to try to understand uh, Native dispossession and the kind of uh, economic development in the United States is intertwined, right? So not these sort of successive kind of steps. Um, so I really appreciate everybody sticking it out for this last session. And it's really exciting to me to be in um, conversation with Paul and Sarah, whose work I've learned so much from already. Um, and so what I'll do, I'm going to try not to use up all my allotted time in the interest of hearing more from them and from everyone um, who's who's with us. So I'm just going to, I'll introduce myself quickly, the book, um, and then I'll spend some time kind of giving an overview of the project's argument. And then at the risk of being a bit tedious, I'll walk through the chapters just so you can see kind of how this plays out. So as, as Jeff mentioned, the book is titled um, Empire Succession, Trusteeship and Native Dispossession in the United States. And the stage that I'm at right now is just the sort of, I have a contract with Princeton, but I'm, I'm still doing um, revisions before I submit the, the the manuscript. So as Jeff mentioned, it's a great time. I, this is still really wide open in a lot of ways. And, um, and, and so I'm very excited for feedback. Well, as I mentioned, um, I, I consider myself a, a historian of indigenous history, but also of the history of capitalism. Um, and the book is really trying to bring these two fields together, which is a development that is starting to pick up some steam in, in my um, discipline of history. And so most historians are aware that um, uh, the United States chose to build its continental empire by treaty, right? Um, but even specialists have almost entirely ignored the details of these payments that the federal government gave to Native Americans for their lands. Um, so this has kept their, I think, unusual structure and very striking implications obscure. Um, and the book is assessing the United States regime of compensated dispossession, and it finds that federal officials deliberately offered periodic and protracted forms of compensation. So in the process, um, federal officials converted what might have been a punctual event, right? And we often think about it this way um, when we're thinking about land dispossession, a kind of one-time lump, lump sum payment for land. Um, they converted this into this enduring and, and asymmetrical economic relationship between the federal government and Native nations. And so the book hones in on one um, especially influential form of prolongated payment, and that is trust funds. 
So to put it um, as simply as I can, um, so soon after its founding, the United States started to purchase native lands by promising to hold funds in trust for the nations who were ceding these lands. And then each year, uh, and then according to the terms that were set out in kind of skeletal form in treaties, federal officials then invested these funds. And um, as it turns out, mostly in state bonds. Each year, usually in the fall, Indian agents would then deliver the interest that accrued on um, these funds um, in, an, in an annual payment that was known as an annuity. So these are terms that might have shown up if you work on Indian affairs. So alongside kind of better known um, tactics in the colonial repertoire, obviously um, the kind of use of outright genocidal force, um, annuities and trusts, I argue really kind of built colonialism treaty by treaty. So I'm going to start because I'm a historian with an anecdote. Um, and I want to start just by describing the removal of the Miami. Um, so the, they are an Algonquian speaking people um, with homelands that spread from Lake Michigan to the Ohio River, um, which they refer to as Miami Yonke or the place of the Miami. Um, and we now call most of it Indiana. And so as you can see on this 1827, um, actually French map, in the decades after Indiana's 1816 statehood, the Miami remained on portions of their homeland, even as the region's economy was rapidly evolving. After a series of land session treaties, the Miami inhabited reservations that you can see surveyed here, strung along um, the Wabash River. But the worst of their dispossession was yet to come. Starting in 1832, the Miami watched as crews dug the Wabash and Erie Canal along the Wabash's north bank. As construction progressed westward from Fort Wayne, land speculators and upstart merchants swarmed onto Miami Yonke, eager to purchase their piece of the canal-driven land boom. So after years of rebuffing federal negotiators, in 1840, the Miami's principal Akima, or chief, Jean-Richard Ville finally acquiesced to the prospect of his nation's removal, if not his own um, personal dispossession. Um, so in a treaty signed that year, Richard Ville's heirs and other prominent Miami families were able to retain um, some, some private land grants, but the Miami nation as a whole was consigned to removal. And this was a fate that the nation um, would not readily accept. So when officials, federal officials came to enforce this treaty six years later, Miami families fled. They sought refuge in swamps and scaled trees to hide from troops. Once recaptured, the Miami gradually joined their kin in detention at Peru, Indiana, um, in a sort of prison that you can see marked here uh, with a red dot. And I just wanna give a kind of shout out to the Miami nation's um, historical work that they've placed on their um, website, which I've taken some of these slides from. And they have really excellent maps um, and a lot of historical materials if you wanna look um, those up. So finally, on October 6th, two removal agents prodded more than 300 Miami onto three canal boats stationed at a lock on the Miami, sorry, the Wabash and Erie Canal. And as they boarded, many Miami carried bundles of earth that had been loosened from burial grounds. Among them was Mary Pasawa, a child of no more than 12. In an oral history that was recorded decades later, she would remember mostly her own incomprehension of that day's events, describing a strange journey away from her home. So given this canal's invasive force on their lives, um, it was almost fitting that the Miami's parting contact with their homelands would occur kind of as this trip, this strange journey along the Wabash and Erie Canal. But there was another striking irony that lurked in the kind of hidden financial ties that had brought this canal into being. Among the many investors who had funded the canal's construction were an indigenous polity with whom the Miami had long shared diplomatic ties. The Ottawa, Ojibwe, and Potawatomi, um, or one group of the Anishinaabeg, who had been removed from lands along Lake Michigan's southwestern shore a decade earlier. So this meant that as the Miami drifted away from their homes, they floated along a transportation route financed in part with native wealth. Through a system of federally controlled investments, the funds of one displaced indigenous nation had become capital for a canal with a quite literal role in the removal of another. 
So between its founding and the Civil War, the United States acquired upwards of 580 million acres of land by negotiating more than 400 treaties with Native people. For nations like the Miami, the process of removal and dispossession that these treaties set into motion was destructive. And then for settlers, this destruction created the kind of landed abundance um, that uh, characterizes America's agrarian transition to capitalism. Yet as the financial forces behind the Miami's removal suggests, losing homelands only opened the first chapter in a much larger and untold story about wealth, colonialism, and diverging paths of economic development. And so today there's a growing acknowledgement, I think within and, and outside of the academy, that indigenous lands were practically stolen. Um, that the price given for them was unbelievably paltry, um, especially if we kind of consider their invaluable importance to their indigenous possessors, right? This is a very asymmetrical transaction in which um, lands are being brought into a kind of commodity market that was just not in, in, in sort of existence for indigenous people in terms of land prior to um, dispossession. So one recent study, and this is another shout out to um, Bobby Lee, whose work is just excellent and has done a lot of work looking at um, the kind of long-term uh, sort of um, spatial dimensions of dispossession. Bobby has found that um, the lands encompassed by the Louisiana Purchase were extinguished for roughly 30 cents an acre. Um, so this is a quarter of the minimum price that the federal government would then accept or ask for those lands, right, um, through its land offices. But reducing um, dispossession to a set of unfair transactions um, it fails to grasp the effects of these transactions over time. And these effects um, resulted not only from the loss of land or from its inadequate compensation, which to be clear, were very significant, uh, but also from the way that this compensation was controlled. So let me outline, and the book outlines kind of three of these effects. So first, trust investments um, yoked native wealth to the prosperity of the very nation that had dispossessed them. Um, and so for reasons that weren't coincidental, trust funds multiplied in tandem with this unprecedented boom at, in state level borrowing. Starting in the second quarter of the 19th century, states started to issue millions of dollars in bonds in order to finance infrastructural improvements that were designed to draw in non-native settlement and stimulate interregional trade. Um, mobilizing ties of patronage that often shaded into corruption, um, state representatives successfully marketed these bonds to federal officials in the Office of Indian Affairs, um, which then purchased them on behalf of native polities, so on behalf of the Indian trust funds. So by the late 1830s, more than $3.8 million of Indian trust fund money sort of flowed into these bank, canal, and railway projects. So just a quick note on this figure. I want to be clear that considered quantitatively, Indian trust fund investments were very easily dwarfed by overseas investments, which was much more significant. Um, some estimates have them by the early 1840s purchasing about half of states' $198 million in debt. But at certain moments, and especially during a period of crisis in the late 1830s and into the early 1840s, um, funds from the Indian Department were, were evidently very critical for states that were starting to face down insolvency. So for those of you um, less familiar with this moment, credit constricted nationwide around 1836, um, after which state governments really struggled to maintain these infrastructural improvement plans that they had you know, passed through bills that were drafted in a period of relative fiscal health in the decade before. Between 1836 and 1838, States actually borrowed as much as they had in the previous 50 years, just trying to keep, kind of keep up with their own plans. And it was exactly in this three year span between 1836 and 38 um, that Indian trust fund investments exploded. With legislatures verging on insolvency, state fund commissioners wrote increasingly urgent letters to the Indian department in hopes of securing investment and forestalling um, collapse. And in many cases, these letters were forwarded by governors, um, congressmen, and cabinet members who had a really kind of personal stake with their home states. So uh, 
this is the kind of picture. By 1838, we see that the Office of Indian Affairs had made 43 separate investments um, in bonds that were issued by Alabama, Kentucky, Maryland, Indiana, Arkansas, Ohio, Michigan, Missouri, Tennessee, and New York. So you can see a clear Jacksonian um, bent to the states that were selected. And so in each of these states, the wealth made of um, the Indian Trust Fund wealth paid for the founding of banks, laying of railroads, and the excavation of canals. Okay, so this brings me to the kind of second point of my argument. In fashioning themselves as trustees, federal officials committed to manage assets to the benefit of the Sestuike Trust, to kind of use the legal verbiage, um, or the beneficiary of these trusts. But in practice, a fundamental contradiction consistently undermined fiduciary duty. And that namely is the Indian department's mandate to acquire indigenous lands at the least cost possible. So in pursuing this mandate, federal officials manipulated their capacity to decide where, how, and if interest payments would be dispersed. And this is where the difference between a one-time payment and a payment spread across time becomes very important. So this was a form of leverage that was very powerful and became a lot more pivotal um, as waves of dispossession continued across the 19th century. Um, so in short, trust funds formed the building blocks of a policy that I call fiduciary colonialism, um, which is a strain of territorial acquisition and kind of population management that was carried out primarily by gaining administrative control over native wealth. At the risk of putting too fine of a point on it, I like to say um, if land was the why of the U.S.'s settler colonial regime, money was the how. So finally, fiduciary colonialism prompted Native polities to craft new forms of governance and claim making in order to wrench back control over their own wealth. And I think we actually still see this legacy today. Removal treaties and trust investments were really this huge um, kind of intrusion of federal officials into Native people's economic lives. Um, but for generations after treaties were signed, Native polities really focused their energies on recapturing wealth that had been squandered um, during the removal era and on building their own fiscal regimes, which were inevitably kind of woven into federal um, fiscal um, uh, institutions. Um, but also geared towards their own national aims. And so for some nations, notably sort of Southeastern Native nations that had kind of strong Republican political form, um, this counter movement to fiduciary colonialism um, really manifested as kind of formal institution building. And you can see here evidence of the kind of robust treasuries that many of these nations had built um, within the decades after removal. But for others, um, bits for autonomy were less statist and kind of built more on kinship formations and diplomatic practices. But in each case, trust investments created this intertwined um, kind of settler and indigenous fiscal regime. So that's the big picture argument of the book. Um, I'll just say a quick note on the scope of the project. So I, um, I, 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 I do a fair bit of analysis of the federal policy and trying to understand kind of the beast but I'm also looking at um, kind of different indigenous polities and how they responded to this regime. And there's an immense amount of um, kind of variety depending on um, the kind of location and timing and the political, the kind of politics of these, nation, uh, these nations themselves. So I look primarily at the Seneca, Chickasaw, Choctaw, Cherokee, Anishinaabeg, and Miami. And so these are all nations who were targeted for removal, but were not always successfully removed. For example, the case of the Seneca, um, who are a Haudenosaunee nation, they remain on their homelands today. And the chronology is roughly um, the 17, sort of from the revolution to um, the 1870s, the end of the treaty era. Okay, so the, I'll, I'll just try to walk through quickly the chapters to hopefully give a sense of how this plays out. Um, so the, the book is divided into three parts. And the first is looking at the formation of fiduciary colonialism. And I'm particularly interested in looking at um, influences on federal trusteeship, two of which I think are very important, um, land speculators and missionaries. And so the first chapter starts on this 1797 treaty um, with the Seneca Nation, which is the earliest example of a trust fund that I have found. Um, and it looks at this treaty um, between Robert Morris, um, who was a prominent land speculator, also one of the signers of the Declaration of Independence, 
um, and uh, had served as the Secretary of the Treasury during the revolution. He offered um, $100,000 in Bank of the United States stock to the Seneca Nation um, as payment for a land session. And the Seneca decided to accept this um, bank stock. Um, it was a very obviously agonizing choice, but they did so um, in part because they actually thought carefully and considered investment uh, a potential source of stability for their nation, which was still really struggling to recover from the kind of tragedy of the American Revolution, which had really ravaged um, their homelands. They had seen neighboring nations like the Oneida accept a one-time lump sum payment and seen that payment dissipate really quickly. And so they decided that having a renewable source of revenue would be something that would assist them in reconstructing their society, their, or their economy. Um, and, you know, just even the fact that Morris, you know, we think of for those of us who are who study um, the treaty system and land dispossession know that the federal government established a kind of monopsony over uh, native land purchases, a, a market with a single purchaser. This was not the case in this early period. Right. So even the fact that Morris is there nosing in buying native land um, indicates this kind of inchoate moment. Um, and so Morris sort of planted the seed um, of, of having a trust fund as a payment. And the, the chapter looks at how that was kind of in, became embedded and sort of grew within the federal apparatus. Um, the second chapter looks um, at, the, at the years after the War of 1812, takes us to the Southeast. Um, and it looks at the spread of um, missionary influences on native nations. So, um, in this moment, this is a period of very rapid um, land dispossession. Native nations were really kind of feeling increasing pressure to start to remove westward, right? We think of removal as being something that began in 1830s, but this was already, um, you know, the, the screws were already being turned, even though federal capacity was not quite there to actually enforce um, a desire for Indian removal. Um, so in this context, um, Southern natives um, kind of negotiated trust funds within treaties to provide education systems. And they did this in collaboration with missionaries who came from the Northeast. And so the chapter is trying to look at um, this kind of Northeastern philanthropic culture, really um, uh, sort of focused on in places like Boston that had um, kind of like early uh, sort of wealth managers um, and how that um, influenced the charitable kind of sector there and was sort of brought in um, through figures like John Ross, who were very interested in trying to structure their nation's monetary compensation in a way that would sustain um, education systems within their own nation. The um, second part of the book turns from the formation of fiduciary colonialism to the wielding of fiduciary colonialism. Um, and this is now um, kind of in this sort of iconic moment of uh, brutal dispossession that we call um, the Indian removal era. And it looks at two circuits of trust investment, one that is centered in the South and looks at banking infrastructure, and then one which I sort of glanced at in my opener, which looks at the North and transportation infrastructure. So the passage of the Indian Removal Act in 1830 helped to lift some of the constraints on federal capacity that had previously somewhat inhibited um, large-scale Indian removal. Um, and federal agents started to negotiate this kind of flurry of territorial acquisitions um, and in response to states who were seeking at the same time increasing investment, um, particularly southern states that were starting to found their own banking systems. So chapter three looks at the Chickasaw Nation um, and um, they ceded a large portion of their homelands at the height of a cotton boom. Um, in northern Mississippi and Alabama and relocated to territories in present day Oklahoma. And in exchange, they received um, what was at that time the largest trust fund, um, which was invested almost entirely in Alabama's um, state financed banking system. And so this was really adjacent to their land session and this bank um, became capital for branches that supplied liquidity and credit um, to speculators who were investing in the Chickasaw land session. Um, chapter four um, pivots north um, and it looks at transportation corridors that carved through native land and that were in part funded by Indian trust fund investments. So this chapter focuses on the Ottawa Ojibwe and Potawatomi, who I've mentioned, um, 
1833, they accepted a trust fund as compensation for their remaining homelands north of Chicago. So their trust fund um, became capital for the Wabash and Erie Canal. And this um, canal was kind of burrowing through unceded Miami land. And um, this, uh, the kind of impact of these transportation corridors was particularly um, notable given the um, kind of repeated and uh, kind of fragmented nature of Northern um, Indian removal. And uh, as the Ottawa Ojibwe and Potawatomi, they were removed several times. And in order to enforce those subsequent removals, the federal government actually withheld the interest on their trust fund um, in order to kind of compel them to remove even further south to lands in present day Kansas. Um, and they actually reinvested this money um, at a moment when state fund commissioners were especially desperate for investment um, in, in um, some improvement programs that were being taken out by or being carried out by Pennsylvania and Maryland. Uh, and I'll just show these, uh, these maps are really cool. I found them in the Chicago Historical Society, but these, these are actually hand-drawn maps that accompanied an Indian agent's oral history of his experience enforcing um, the removal of the Ottawa Ojibwe and Potawatomi. And you can see um, there's kind of wagons and um, sailboats uh, on the, the lakes here. And um, he draws in the second map, railroads um, and steamers. So you can see that this connection between Indian removal and the transportation revolution in the Midwest was even evident to contemporaries. So the third part of the book looks at a succession of crises um, that disrupted fiduciary control. Um, and the first is the state bond crisis that lasted from 1839 to 1842. Um, then a succession of um, indigenous and trader claims against the federal government in the 1840s and 50s. And then finally, the Civil War, which actually split the Federal Indian Affairs Bureau from the southern states in which many Indian trust funds were invested. And so this last part of the book is kind of doing a complicated move of, of looking at these crises that sort of bring out these tensions within this fiduciary system but ultimately allowed the system to kind of ratchet its control over native wealth further. So states infrastructural boom really went bust in the early 1840s. By 1842, eight states and one territory of Florida um, could no longer service their debts and actually defaulted on their bondholders, including the Indian trust funds. So this chapter, chapter five, um, looks at how this state financial collapse kind of rippled uh, westward to this turbulent Indian territory and eastward across the Atlantic where foreign creditors demanded Congress assume states' debts. And so states' um, defaults really threatened to arrest the flow of annuity payments at this moment of escalating tension between uh, removed nations, displaced nations who were now compressed in this very small, uh, much smaller than their original homelands, right, in, in what we now know as Oklahoma, um, and who were adjacent to, you know, very powerful um, kind of equestrian military um, societies like the Comanche and Kickapoo, who continued to, who were raiding into Indian territory. And so um, I look at how Native leaders in Indian territory took this moment to start building international diplomacy. Um, and this is a painting of a very, um, a, an international summit held at Taliqua, um, hosted by the Cherokee. Um, and how these sort of moments of uh, international diplomacy among Native nations in a context of escalating violence really panicked um, federal Indian affairs officials who were um, really afraid of what they called as a pan-Indian war. And so when states uh, defaulted on their bondholders, they um, were very clear in persuading Congress that the federal government needed to cover states' debts and ensure that annuity payments continued to flow west. So the next chapter looks at the kind of explosion of Indian affairs claims um, in this period. So in the 1840s and 50s, Native nations were um, struggling to recover from removal, um, and they sought additional infusions of capital. Um, in, and um, in part, they did this by enlisting the assistance of lawyers and, and kind of specialized claims agents and started to pursue monetary claims through the kind of constitution's petition clause 
um, to recapture wealth that had been squandered during the removal era. And while these claims were flown to Congress, there at the same time, um, there was a growing set of claims brought by Indian traders against Native nations themselves. And these local traders uh, regularly inflated the cost of goods that they sold to Native customers um, and then sort of started to kind of uh, pressure the Indian department to have their um, kind of ostensible debts repaid through a similar claims process. And so together, these two classes of claims really started to drive up the cost of dispossession, the cost of conquest, at a moment when the United States um, territorial acquisitions in the 1848 Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo um, already strained the country's um, fiscal and military capacities. And then um, the last crisis I cover, uh, obviously a biggie for um, U.S. historians. So um, I look at what happened to this Indian trust fund system during the Civil War. And so soon after um, uh, the outbreak of the war, the Union Army actually rapidly withdrew from Indian territory. And it, it stopped delivering annuity payments, um, you know, kind of beyond enemy lines. And simultaneously, the southern states in which a lot of Indian trust fund wealth had been invested, and of course, this is still kind of a legacy from the Jacksonian era, given that the maturities of these bonds are often 30-year bonds, um, they uh, stopped to, they, the southern states that had a lot of these investments stopped remitting payments, obviously, to the union. And so this chapter looks at, you know, kind of what happens that this, this trust fund system is fracturing alongside the union itself. Indigenous leaders um, really saw the retreat of the Union Army from Indian territory as a violation of treaty obligations, um, and especially the obligation to offer protection. And federal failures to protect really created this cascade of civil wars within Native nations themselves. So in the, many of the Southeastern Native nations who had been displaced, uh, Oklahoma, um, were themselves had small um, tiers of slaveholders. And so they were themselves marked by this sort of succession, uh, this, this sectional conflict um, that was erupting at the national scale in the United States. So um, those who remained in Indian territory, um, particularly more um, uh, nations like the Chickasaw, who were much more dominated by slaveholder elites, um, quickly signed treaties with the Confederacy and had, there were many Native people who fought alongside the Confederacy, as you can see in this um, painting of Battle of Pea Ridge. So as the war kind of wore on and blockades hobbled the Southern economy, the Confederacy, which had promised to kind of assume the mantle of trusteeship, really started to struggle and, and try to pay out annuities in cotton. So as in previous moments of crisis, um, federal trusteeship uh, only became kind of more bolder and penetrative each time it was tested. And without slaveholders opposition, thinking of the federal government now on the union side, um, you know, with wartime mobilization added at this unprecedented level, the federal government burst through any lingering constraints on territorial expansion. And this is obviously a, a part of the story that I think will be very familiar to this crowd. So the railroad and homestead acts um, kind of scythed through native territories. And at the same moment during the civil war, um, the, uh, Lincoln actually approved the annulment of treaties as this wartime exigency. So this chapter is looking forward to the end of the treaty era, which culminates in 1871 when Congress ends this practice altogether. So in terms of this, policy of fiduciary colonialism, I just want to emphasize that the United States was actually not unique in this um, respect. If you look across at other Anglophone, kind of quintessential Anglophone settler formations, um, you see very or similar, or at least um, systems of fiduciary control that are very resonant with what we see in the U.S. In Canada, um, Indian trust funds appeared in the early 19th century. Uh, and when British administrators actually arranged for the proceeds of tracts sold from the Grand River Six Nations, who are some uh, Haudenosaunee people who had um, relocated to Canada during the revolution, um, and used uh, built a trust fund for them that invested wealth in a canal project that actually contributed to their own land loss. And British settlers in early 19th century Australia 
um, you know, had initially tried to, that tested this policy of terra nullius and soon realized that that was, um, you know, kind of incompatible with the reality of Aboriginal possession. And so they tried to resolve this tension by demanding land sessions and offering Aboriginal polities reservations that were held in trust. Um, And later on in the 19th century, this had set a precedent for a system of um, labor extraction that placed the wages of Aboriginal workers in um, in trust with state appointed protectors, and this regime resulted in a very large scale um, uh, uh, theft of wages that is an ongoing legal issue into the present. In the United States, uh, trusteeship over native wealth only strengthened after 1871. So during the late 19th and early 20th century land grab of allotment that we've heard about already today, um, trusteeship really kind of became uh, more granular and started to um, uh, take hold at the individual scale. So these, uh, some allottees uh, received forms of compensation in individual Indian money accounts, um, as they would come to be called, and these endured for over a century. Um, until they attracted the scrutiny of Blackfeet Nation treasurer and activist Eloise Cobell. So in 1996, Cobell filed a federal lawsuit that would, over a decade and a half of proceedings, uncover real litany of abuses, including rampant negligence in accounting and reporting, the loss or misappropriation of trust funds, including the conversion of funds for the United States' own use, um, the squandering of oil and other extractive leases, Um, and the failure to distribute lease royalties, court judgments, and interest payments. So according to estimates that Cobell's um, forensic accountants generated, the funds that had been misappropriated tallied $176 billion. Um, So this sum was dwarfed, uh, so this sum dwarfed the $3.4 billion payment that was eventually paid under President Barack Obama, which if I'm not um, mistaken, Uh, remains the largest class action settlement payment uh, ever paid out by the federal government in the United States. So it's important to note that today, you know, the the federal trust responsibility does remain this important standard, right? It's very important for providing uh, treaty obligations and the kind of um, sort of uh, present day versions of treaty obligations, things like the Indian Health Service, in particularly for reservation communities. So I do want to clarify that that is, you know, um, a kind of a, a minimum standard of obligation that Native nations continue to hold the federal government to account. But at the same time, trusteeship does encase Native wealth, right, in um, federal control. And this has often been to the systemic detriment of Native autonomy and prosperity. And so historians have long, again, you know, recognized the unjust taking of Native land. And so this book is trying to look at the delinquency of a federal trustee and the kind of monetary side of this equation. So that's it for me. Thank you so much. Thank you, Emily. Uh, So we have Paul Freimer and we have Sarah Quinn. Paul from Princeton, Sarah from the University of Washington uh, as discussants. Thanks, um, um, Jeff, for inviting me and giving me the opportunity to to read Emily's uh, really terrific uh, manuscript. And thanks, Emily, for, for writing it and and presenting it to me. So, um, so first off, uh, yeah, I, I thought this was really super interesting. There's lots of great material here, um, lots of great details. It, this is a really crowded field of historical work, and yet you distinguish yourself with um, some really impressive um, contributions that I think are, that are extremely important. So that's that's really hard to do, right? Um, I mean, you've read this field too. It's, it's um, so I. Um, there, there are lots of pieces here which the broader historical you know work was is known and yet you offered really new and interesting you know material to re-explain it um, and so I thought that was all really super interesting and, and um, um, yeah so all, all of that is, is really great um, and it's also well written um, uh, the maps are, are great um, and um, uh, so I, I think it has, yeah, the makings of a, a really uh, terrific book. Um, and so, yeah, so here, here then will be, I'll just kind of give some various ideas I had. So remember to, um, with every sentence I say, um, you can add, uh, without me saying it, that I'm a political scientist. So I'm offering, you know, and, and I've read 
lots of historical work. And, you know, so, and I know a lot of historical work won't do or doesn't do for purposeful, good, uh, appropriate reasons, you know, some of the things that I would suggest. Um, so like, for instance, you know, um, I know you, you read, you wrote up a, a, bit, a bit of an intro to explain things, but um, I didn't see specifically, like, I think an intro chapter, um, which actually would just cover what you just did in the, um, in your presentation now, uh, would be really great. Um, you, the first chapter you have is, is a terrific chapter, but it's really, it's like chap, or at least for, you know, I know historians spend a, a long buildup, but I, I think there was a moment maybe even, or if you're going to stick with chapter one as chapter one, um, kind of eight, 10 pages in or so to kind of just lay out the argument explicitly, um, clearly in the way you just did, uh, you know, in the presentation here. Um, and where I was specifically sometimes confused or wanting more um, to kind of lay out is um, so kind of some of the key terms. Um, so annuities starting there, right? So, so there's a broader recognition Obviously, the treaties were an important way in which um, the United States uh, participated in its colonial uh, expansion, um, treaties with Native, Native nations. There is another, um, which, you know, is about the use of money, buying, or, you know, paying Native nations for their land. Um, one book here, uh, Stuart Banner, do you know his book? Um, uh, yeah, uh, so that's that's kind of his major argument, right, that, that uh, the United States paid for, and in, in that, you know, there's other plenty of people said this as well, but right, the United States paid for this land. So that's one, one piece, right, is paying, right? And paying isn't the same as annuities or trusts and the, and the like. And so you're contributing not just that money was a big part of it, um, which you were saying, but you're also then saying there's an important role for annuities and, and these longer standing um, uh, contracts um, through, often through treaties that, uh, invest Native Americans into American expansion and into the political economy of American expansion, um, and also um, contribute to the nation's own, uh, the United States' um, own development, its own political economy in, in expanding across the nation. So, but these are all kind of, you know, somewhat distinct points. And so, um, as a social scientist, um, you know, I would like a little more just kind of that labor laying out of these different things and what annuities is doing, what money is doing, um, uh, you know, and how this fits into, I guess, number one would be the American state, right? The kind of the power, the country is, as you say, um, repeatedly correctly, right? That the, the government is, is worried about its lack of military power and its inability to create a military uh, power of the, the size necessary um, to, uh, to defend itself with native nations. And of course, also with other threats, the Spanish, the British, um, the, uh, sometimes the French and, and, and so forth, as well as, you know, it, um, uh, settler, not settler nations per se, but, you know, places like, uh, the uh, you know western borders of Kentucky and the like, right? That people have talked about that these were also threats uh, to the United States. So the United States was always feeling threatened, um, as you know, and and um, and so it was looking for ways to, with a, a weak administrative state, um, uh, conquer um, you know large swaths of land and peoples. And so you know money was money was a big part of this, and then you know annuities was a big part of this. Um, so. So kind of laying out those different pieces, um, um, I think, I think would be, I think it'd be good just early on to kind of lay out what it is uh, each piece is doing. Uh, there were times um, where I wondered, is annuity the right word or is just money the right word um, in certain contexts? Um, and I say that because I think what you're doing is really fascinating with annuities. I think that is, is a fascinating, powerful point. And so you don't want to expand it too far, right? You want to really be specific as to what it's doing and then also what it's not doing, right? At times, it's also just um, the government trying to pay off 
uh, you know, populations, um, uh, a variety of populations uh, to, to handle different things. Um, and so to kind of get a sense of what it is that's going on with trust with annuities um, and how that is, is linked in with, you know, with political economy. Um, so even there early on, like in chapter one, as you have, you know, you talk about, you start with Hamilton's, you know, sort of the role of the West in helping the economy. Um, but I'd like to see more specifically there on the different versions that this can take um, and, you know, and using things like uh, fiduciaries, trusts, uh, annuities and the likes um, to, to provide this. So, so again, I, that's all just, I think, clarifying. Um, but I, I think that would be, that would be helpful there. Um, uh, the role, okay, so here too, kind of, it's a little bit political, institutionally, but um, the role of the, you know, the federal government versus private actors, right? There's, so there's a lot of private actors out there and there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of instability, as you know, finan financial instability, especially involving uh, claiming native lands. Um, you know, you, you probably know the, the Supreme Court case, Johnson v. McIntosh um, from the early 1820s. You know, that was about the, the fact that so many different people claimed ownership to the land. And it wasn't just the United States versus, um, you know, a native nation or an individual, um, you, know, uh, uh, you know, somebody from the Cherokees or, or, or Choctaws or whatever. Um, it was also Spanish and it was and, and British. Right. And there were so many different uh, claims to land or, or multiple claims just among uh, American settlers themselves. And so this instability was something where, again, the political economy, it was very important for the U.S. government to kind of set the contours and create a stabilizing economy over this process. Johnson v. McIntosh, you know, is part of that. The Yazoo land scandal, right, is another one that's an example, right, where um, with the Georgia legislature, where there's, where there's taking and selling um, land that they didn't even own, right? So, so this, I think, is part of, again, a broader process where the, the government is is constantly kind of struggling um, both with native nations, but also with lots of different economic actors that are out there that are, you know, a variety of just uh, entrepreneurs, uh, swindling um, uh, and the like, and, and not just of, you know, whites versus um, uh, indigenous populations, but um, whites versus whites and, and all of that. So to kind of, again, just kind of uh, make sense of that, I think, um, somewhere, you know, Paul Gates, you may have, have mentioned him, um, but he wrote a lot about this, right? He's that old uh, land historian and has a lot of material right on the, uh, the role of, uh, of capitalists uh, trying to, to use land for their own purposes. So again, I think this is all just kind of clarifying. Um, and, uh, you know, as a social scientist, it, it's upfront, right? just kind of to lay it out to then when you go through the, the rich material. Um, so then another kind of bigger thing, and then, and then I'll just give a couple of specific chapter examples. Um, so you do a, a great job, um, kind of going back and forth between agency and exploitation. Um, and I think you really, you're very nuanced in that regard. At times, you know, I read a lot of middle ground, um, in your work, um, which is notable, right? Because, uh, uh Richard White says that, middle ground basically ends with the war of 1812. Um, but in chapter three, that's a middle ground chapter, right? Of the Choctaws seemingly having quite a bit of, of agency and power. Um, and that, that was really fascinating. Um, I was gonna say in a moment, but I'll just say now, chapter three might've been my favorite chapter. I thought that was really, really, really interesting material um, about, about how the Choctaws were, were interacting um, with the federal government, with the state of Alabama. Um, uh, you know, the material you have about, um, you know, the ways in which uh, Choctaws were invested in, 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 in state debt and the like, that was all really interesting. Um, and um, so, so there's that agency part. Um, and then there's the, then the exploitation part. And that's, you know, sometimes when you're talking about the agency part, um, I'm wondering, you know, like the Choctaws still end up with a pretty bad deal, right, ultimately. Um, and so you're kind of going, back and forth, I guess maybe just a little bit of clarifying there a bit more. 
Um, so, cause that chapter, it, again, it, it's really fascinating, but it kind of leaps out as a, it's also sort of somewhat jarring, right. In the sense of what we know, right. Um, because this is the moment of, of, um, Indian removal. Um, and you're showing, you know, quite a bit of negotiatory power. Um, and so, you know, that's kind of a blockbuster chapter, um, to make, but I think just to kind of clarify that, you know, with it, within this broader, obviously, inequity of, of removal and, and, um, you know, and, and then the more, the broader thing that we widely know, right. The treaties are constantly reneged. The U S government never really fulfills them. They give land that isn't good. You know, the land they promised, they constantly rewrite them and blah, blah, blah. So, um, so anyway, so I thought that was a really interesting point. Um, you, you do the same. The other chapter that I really like is, is actually chapter seven. Um, and, um, cause there too, I thought, that actually seems like a moment, almost like, you know, the War of 1812, where there's that brief moment, you know, and, and White talks about this, of where, um, you know, there, there's a moment there where, where Native people are, have opportunities with other alliances to really exert some power, because um, the British and the U.S. Are, and the Spanish are all playing off each other. And the Civil War case is another one. And, and you gave a lot of material that I've, I've always been fascinating and wanting to know about and, and has never seen. So I'm, I really compliment you on this. Um, and, um, you know, the role of Confederacy and the instability that the Civil War brings out and the ways in which, um, uh, you know, Native nations out in the West are able, you know, have an opportunity to kind of uh, exert some, some power um, and exert some deals, both from the Confederacy and from um, from the United States. And so I found that really interesting. It's another just kind of really, I think, moment that has been overlooked in terms of a potential opportunity, then gets, again, like all these others, closed off and uh, and then leads to actually massive violence, um, you know, and a, and a backlash against it. Um, so, um yeah, so I, I thought that was all really interesting. Um, and you might even want to say, you know, a little more uh, explicitly about how we see these these moments of agency um, in ways that maybe other people have overlooked. I know the borderland literature uh, emphasizes this in different places. And certainly like, uh, you know, the literature on the Comanches, DeLay, uh, uh, Hemelekin and others um, have emphasized this with Comanches specifically. Um, but you seem to be to be saying this more broadly um, in these specific moments. I think that's really interesting and, and worth doing. So, okay, a couple more things and I'll be quiet. Um, so there are times that I, I wanted some things sort of separated from each other. Like chapter three, you have, I mean, there's multiple chapters within chapter three. Jackson and the bank is really fascinating in its own. Um, uh, the relationship between uh, the Chickasaws and, and um, Alabama um, is really interesting. Sorry, I think I said Choctaws before Chickasaws. Um, sorry, man. Yeah, um, uh, and um, uh, that's really fascinating. The, you know, the relationship between the two, um, and um, uh, and then you had some really fascinating stuff about how Jackson's bank strategies was a way to then direct money for the federal for his executive branch to uh, oversee the money going to state governments. That was all really interesting. I mean, I don't know if there's like a separate article there about Jackson and, and, uh, and banking. I, I've never seen any of that. That was really, really super interesting, um, you know, to me. So, um, and at times, rightly so, it was so rich on its own that, you know, the, uh, the Chickasaws would, would kind of drop out for a bit. You bring them back and you put it all together, but um, but that yeah, there were there were just multiple things going on, you know, which is all for the good, but um, but just to kind of figure that out. There were a few places where I felt like I wondered if you were going too strong with the role uh, of annuities, you know, like uh, for a half. This is on page two eighteen. For a half century, uh, the federal government had offset an invasion of native lands by dispensing annuities. I and mean, yes, annuities, but it's also it's treaties and it's like um, I might just kind of it's it's. I mean, it's treaties, right? I mean, that's how others have kind of used it. And so that's where I, you know, as I was saying earlier, I think you want to be specific with what annuities is doing um, as opposed to more broadly the, the, the role of treaties and the like. Um, 
He said the same on page 57, carried out in large part as a reaction to federal annuities, Northwest nations, armed defense of their homelands. Um, you know, again, that was, you know, more kind of uh, reactions to treaties, right? Or reactions to just violations of, of uh, sovereignty and the like, um, of which annuities are part of, right? But so I just, I just want to over, over stress that um, some of the time. And, and fitting here with, you know, something you raised in your uh, just notes at the very beginning, you know, um, which is, is really hard to do for any of us doing kind of historical uh, or kind of political economy or institutional work of this period is dealing with violence, right? And the role of violence separate. Um, the violence is in some ways, it's already been written about a lot and it's so obvious that it's less intellectually, uh, you know, interesting and, and, and pointing out the nuances is the power of your work, right? The political economy that underlies this um, that we don't see, but somehow just expressing that, you know, up front uh, somewhere. Um, it's hard, you know, yeah, just something like that um, uh, would just, would be enough. Um, and then the final, this is just kind of a half, kind of a question, just because I've personally kind of struggled in understanding this. I know there's a, there's a, obviously the huge work by Hemelek and, uh, and uh, DeLay, um, uh, Jeff and others, if you don't know, they, I think they both published books on the Comanches, I think it was 2007. Um, and, um, one was Comanche empire and the other was, uh, I can't remember the title, but war of a thousand deserts. Yes. War of a thousand deserts. And I think between the two of them, they won close to 20 awards. Um, they were published by the same press. Even it was quite a monumental thing. Um, and they were both great books and, and I've, I've learned a lot from them, but one thing I just found interesting and, in, and in going through, um, uh, federal archives and, and, and government papers is Mexico seemed to be terrified and, and often affected by the Comanches. The U S at least by their words. Uh, and I didn't go that far with this, but they just never seem to be that concerned. They seem more bemused, um, that the Comanches made these big threats. Um, but that they didn't seem the same concern. And I say that, I mean, in general, they kind of separate their, Mexico's dealings with the Comanches, which was very problematic for Mexico and, you know, for all the reasons that these past authors have said, um, but then the, the role of the U.S. Uh, a lot of your really fascinating stuff, which I thought was interesting, is, is um, uh, Native nations in, you know, the broader uh, uh, Indian territory um, and how they were trying to interact with these populations that were that basically already that pre-existed uh, as they were moved in. So um, I thought that was really interesting. I just I just had this kind of footnote about the Comanches that I'm not entirely sure, at least with the, the U.S. federal government, how much they were concerned uh, about them um, per se. But um, broader punchline uh, is is yeah. I, I thought this was really terrific, and I'm excited uh, to see it uh, uh, move forward. I'm on a the the uh, I'm currently on the board of Princeton University Press, so I look forward to seeing it. Uh, go through there. Um, so uh, as you move along, but uh, yeah, I think this will be a real blockbuster and, and I'm very excited by it. All right. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Paul. Uh, Sarah Quinn. Hi, I'm very happy to be part of your interdisciplinary hat trick in the panel. <laughs> Um, so thank you for inviting me. Uh, I'm here in Seattle. So this is the traditional land of the Coast Salish peoples, which touches the shared waters of all the tribes and bands within the Duwamish, Suquamish, Tulalip, and Muckleshoot nations. Um, I want to thank Dr. Connolly for sharing her manuscript. It is a, maybe it's not hard for everybody. It is a hard thing to turn over a whole manuscript when it's not quite done. Um, I don't know that I would have had the nerve, um, uh, but hopefully it's easier to do when the manuscript is this good. I was excited to read it. I was not disappointed. Um, the book, it's carefully researched. It's forcefully argued. It's beautifully written. A ladder is not easy to do with financial topics where power dynamics get buried in the most dry and boring of language and details. I mean, even if we think about the word fiduciary, you can almost like yawn while you're saying it. 
um, until we remember that it means that I have control over your money. Or in this case, your wartime enemy now controls your assets. Right? So this book breaks through this legalese to show the world of power, domination, exploitation, and resistance that's um, shut through these relationships. So I think Dr. Connolly's being somewhat modest about the nature of her contributions. And I want, for my comments, I thought of uh, how I would underscore them. Um, things that I would stress in the framing to take or leave. Um, there's probably some sort of social science bias here where it's like, here's where we summarize the theoretical contributions. Um, so this is this is how I how I saw that. Um, I see five main contributions here. The first is a contribution to our understanding of the role of financial relationships as part of settler colonialism. War is expensive, founders knew they had military advantages, but were short on funds, and they turned to compensated disp dispossession, um, which is a phrase that's incredibly important for this book, as a negotiated alternative. And this compensation comes in the form um, of annuities, payments over time, um, and in those payments, they're funded through trusts managed um, by representatives and bureaucrats um, on the part of the national government. So these trusts are in a real, very real way, war by other means. Connolly writes, at the heart of Knox's plan was a theory that modest outlays and annuities could forge loyalties with native polities that would save enormous sums while still transferring native lands to the United States possession. Annuities were designed to splinter native unity and discourage armed territorial defense by offering a consistent reward for remaining in an individuated diplomatic relationship with the federal government. Important point that she makes in the manuscript is that the U.S. did not expect, at these early stages, there wasn't an expectation that the native nations would survive and that these obligations would have to be kept. And yet an ongoing relationship was formed by accepting, and I'm quoting here, quote, by accepting an investment as a form of payment, the Seneca had entered into an enduring economic relationship with the United States that had, like all treaty-bound commitments, bound both signatories in peace and alliance. So this brings me to the second, I think, um, contribution of this book, which is to show us the politics and the inner workings of fiduciary, fiduciary colonialism. These claims are then deployed and contested in a variety of ways over time. And while the book doesn't lean on labels, I nevertheless think it shows a push and pull between what I would call four different social logics of the fiduciary relationship. First is a military, militarized model that is kind of more directly, I think, related to the point above, that a trust can be a tool of war. Um, and especially if there's an expectation of genocidal um, of a genocidal future to kind of nullify the commitment. It's a kind of a purely militaristic um, orientation to the trusts. There is um, a, what I would call a dispossession model, contestations within na native communities about this that is emphasizing that these trusts are necessarily a tool of dispossession. Um, and I'm gonna have to check um, with Dr. Connolly about my pronunciation, the spiritual leader, Tenskawa, Tawa? Uh, Sorry, I just tripped over that. Tenskwatawa. Tenskwatawa, thank you. Kind of organized against these treaties um, as part of a kind of a, a movement against it. So this is a model that is in many ways kind of recognizing the militarized model and recognizing this as fundamentally about disposition. But a lot of the book is about kind of the two, what I would call those two other models that end up dominating, a sovereign relations model and a guardianship model. The sovereign relationship model is, uh, is uh, asserted by native nations. Um, actually, I wrote this up differently, but I think it's gonna make sense if I switch it. Let me talk about the guardianship model first. The guardian, guardianship model assumes that indigenous individuals were incapable of giving, I'm quoting here, sorry, I just sort of went through and reading. I'm gonna quote Dr. Connolly again. She wrote, writes beautifully, I decided to take advantage of that. Quote, guardianship assumed indigenous individuals were incapable of giving consent, drawing contracts or forming governments in short of managing their own economic affairs. Believing indigenous peoples stunted and dependent, the federal capacity to manage money or 
to manage money superior, Calhoun approached trusteeship as if the terms of guardianship applied. So this is a logic of racist patrimonialism, and it's incredibly important because it justifies a set of terrible behaviors and a deep perversion of principal asset relations implied by any kind of fiduciary relationship. At times, the trusts are treated as subordinate debt and payouts are delayed. This is not always the case um, because under the threat of war, trusts do get paid um, and prioritized. Um, funds are reappropriated at different points as a form of what I would like a form of taxation. So for example, the kind of drawing on these funds to pay for the care of refugees after the Civil War, of Native refugees and this, the Civil War, and um, mishandling and management. Um, and these violations of the fiduciary trust are absolutely reliant on this kind of racist patrimonialist guardianship model um, that is dominating among the um, the U.S. national government, but it is contested by a sovereign's relation, a so, what I would call the sovereign relations model. The native nations are asserting their rights, in fact, as owners of these assets, and the book shows that there is um, this continual push um, among the among the native uh, nations and communities that are receiving these um, these annuities. Um, to assert that these are relationships between sovereigns that have to be honored. To quote um, from the book, as much as federal trusteeship snared the Seneca into an enduring relationship with the United States, it also positioned the Seneca to demand accountability and ultimately to compel the continued payment of the annuity. Right. So much of the book is this kind of give and pull, especially between the sovereign's relation model and the guardianship model of what kind of logics are going to dominate um, the workings of these trusts. And I think that's a real contribution kind of sh um, sh showing how these are playing out. So, um, so, so a third contribution is to our understanding of the politics of, of um, native politics and development, right? This was, as Connolly writes, quote, a strategy to seek wealth and security out of continual losses, end quote. Um, what we have, what we also see in the book is a profound kind of what we might consider policy feedback. Once this is created, a whole political world is all right, is starts to form around these trusts and their dispensations. And so, and we have a whole, the politics of these trusts are of course as much a politics of native nations as they are of the US federal government um, and the national government. So the book also gives us a sense of, um, of the politics within native nations about who's going to get these and who has control over them and kind of political jockeying about making them and how to distribute them. Um, and a kind of a politics of also continually uh, monitoring and advocating for access to them. Um, so I think this kind of fleshing out of these politics is also super important and super interesting. The fourth um, contribution is a contribution to our understanding of American political and economic development, right? This discussion that the, of and, and I think I think this has two parts. One, the, there are markets that grow up around these payments. Um, so once it's kind of these predictable cash flows are coming through, there are kind of markets um, that develop or of trade around where these payments are coming through. But also this gets to the kind of use of funds for internal improvements in the United States. Another way to avoid taxation, but still govern. Um, and as kind of said in the book and in the presentation, especially important as a backdrop in times of crisis. So what, if you get crisis and European investors pull out, um, the, the national bureaucratic managers through Indian Affairs who are in charge of this model are not pulling this money out where everybody else is, and in fact become incredibly important as backstops. The fifth um, contribution that I want to highlight is a real contribution to the literature on racial capitalism, work that details how capitalist development was shaped around racial regimes. And here as a sociologist, I start from the work of Fields and Fields that defines racism as a system of double standards based on ancestry. 
uh, a system that has race itself as a first product in the sense of a mythological differences between groups that don't really exist in a biologically and meaningful sense, but that have very real consequences because of racist practices. Right. The work on racial capitalism stresses continuities between settler colonial and capitalism and the racial orders that circulate through them. And within capitalism, especially in the settler colonial context, racism enacts a set of double standards around whose labor is paid and who can be stolen, whose money is protected or whose is vulnerable to theft, whose land is taken and who gets that land. So this guardianship model of fiduciary capitalism is, I think, a powerful example of racial capitalism in U.S. development. The refu there's these moments where you see there's refusal to dis of um, Indian fairs to dispense funds for native trades um, or for um, internal development in native communities, eat for things like mills, even when that money has already been earmarked for specifically that purpose but using that money instead to invest in internal improvements that will expand the settler nation, both economically and geography. And this is, I think, a, a, a powerful example of racial capitalism at work and kind of what that looks like, how the racial order is itself present, like structuring where the money is, is going to go. Um, my questions and suggestions, um, one was probably along the lines of uh, the previous comments, which is I, I would encourage you to kind of own these contributions and really play them up. Um, I think they're great. And I think uh, I would encourage you to highlight them. Um, I had some questions about the legacy of the dispossession model, the kind of critical critiques of of these treaties and the annuity, of these kind of annuity forms. Um, I, I just had the sense that there was probably a lot more there. Uh, but uh, there's only so much we can do in a book, but if we have time, I would invite you to speak more on that. Um, and then also questions about the bureaucracy of Indian affairs and management and kind of forces and fights that might be going around the scenes. Um, a lot of times we kind of see these make people making decisions around it, but I don't necessarily have a sense of what might be going on in those offices. Um, but in the in the end, these are small things. The concepts of compensated disposition and fiduciary colonialism and the ways they are spelled out here are real contributions to multiple disciplines. And I believe this book is gonna be read and taught widely and it was a pleasure to read and congratulations on the accomplishment. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, Emily, do you wanna to respond? To I do. I mean, I also, I truly want to die because I just realized <laughs> that I had not sent the introduction as part of this manuscript. So I have no idea how Paul and Sarah managed to not only read this thing, but also, I mean, it's now that introduction is moot because I've had the exact structure of the introduction kind of explained to me and, 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 and laid out for me so generously, but I am Again, so I'm just very sorry that I somehow in compiling the PDF, I just altogether like left out the, the, the single thing that might have made this experience less excruciating for you too. So apologies for that. But I, I think that these, so Paul, your comments, you kind of like just touched on all of these little things that are not little things, these very large questions that I, I really still have about the project. And I think, you know, there's, as I continue to kind of, revise, I think that these questions about agency and exploitation, I mean, the problem is, you know, you did such a good job of landing on these things that I don't really have good satisfying responses right now, but I just affirm that I think what I'm trying to do is have a history that looks at the absolutely, you know, uh, kind of unquestionable degree of, uh, of, 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 of like plunder of native wealth without overwriting the fact that within that system, Native people were still making decisions. Um, and so I think that even, you know, that that those decisions still had consequences, even within this landscape of, of total kind of, um, you know, undeniable colonialism and plunder. So that that agency versus exploitation question, I think, is exactly one of the things that I do really need to to just say outright, you know, this is a problem that's in the manuscript that that um, it, it, and flagging that from the beginning in an introduction, I think is a really um, will be a way to guide my reader. Um, uh, I appreciate 
I think a lot of my chapters have multiple chapters. And I think a lot of the work that I need to do is, is to kind of spin off pieces um, or just put them aside. And I appreciate, I think chapter three, uh, you know, it has a lot of moments where I'm nerding out. I I'm glad that um, you like the chapter. Um, it's the one that's about banking. And um, so, yeah, I, I think there are a lot of places where I'll, where I'll end up um, just kind of scything through and, and trying to put stuff, uh, trying to streamline. Um, and then, oh, the other point that you landed on that I think is really important and that, again, I'm still teasing apart is when is it important that there is a treaty and when is it important that there is a, an invested uh, annuity and when was it just annuities? Because not every annuity was actually generated by a trust fund. Some were just generated by congressional appropriations, and that's actually something that I'm still continuing to work through. Um, but again, it is something that I need to be clear about from the beginning and, and and kind of specifying all of these terms. And your point about the Comanche is really well taken too. I think that one of the things that's interesting to me and that is a diff- bit difficult to tease apart is how much security threats are actually fears. So I I don't see those fears being vocalized about the Comanche in in places like Congress necessarily, but definitely within the um, Office of Indian Affairs, they are, they make a lot of noise about the possibility of pan-Indian wars. But is that something that they really actually fear or is that their way of advocating for their continued access to the annuity system? And is it sort of the Um, protection of the status quo and of their own status with which they themselves accrue, you know, which Indian agents accrue as, as, as being able to meet out these payments. So I take that. That's a really good point to kind of go back there and make sure that I'm not being a little bit too credulous of federal um, Indian affairs officials in the 19th century, which is never a good idea. Um, (laughs) Sarah, these comments are just uh, incredible. I mean, I really genuinely are. I'm just like, you have delivered me an outline for this introduction and, I, I really, um, I really, I mean, you kind of only gesture to your questions, um, but uh, yeah, there were certainly fights about the federal bureaucracy, particularly by the time you get to the Civil War era, you know, especially between the military and civilian sort of dimensions of the um, the Indian Affairs Department. One of the things that I think is kind of wide open that we don't really have a great history of is the importance of that moment in the 18, I mean, 1848, which just op- kind of suddenly puts the federal government in charge of this incredibly, you know, large territory that it has very little geographical knowledge of, and that, it, and, and, and a really, um, you know, kind of hearkening back to our the presentations earlier today about California polities are so diverse. They're so different. Um, the people who are on the Great Plains are so different than the people who the um, Federal Indian Affairs um, Bureau had been dealing with. So it's really this the 1850s is this really interesting period where I, I see a lot of chaos in the federal bureaucracy. Um, and I'm only kind of, I have that chapter that's on claims that covers this period and tries to kind of get at how important that moment is. But I think there's a lot more that's going on, especially even in, even in thinking about things like logistics, um, where Indian affairs has become really this new phase shift. And you see at the same time, these very, very um, kind of horrific uh, escalations of violence in places like California, obviously, but also in the Pacific Northwest. Um, so yeah, I, I think you're, 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 you know, your, your nose is onto something here. Like there's a lot more that I could um, kind of unpack around the sort of bureaucracy itself. Um, but yeah, apart from that, I'd, I'd love to get to questions and um, hear other people's thoughts. So I'll stop there, but thank you. Eric Alston had a comment that he wanted to make. Eric, yeah, I'm I'm quite curious to uh, to see the book when it comes out. Um, a couple very short comments. One, our work on state trust lands opened my eyes to the number and distinct forms of public trust management duties that have existed for such a long time, mm-hmm. and. To me, one one way to argue against the kind of infantilizing guardianship narrative, in my mind, is showing comparative management of public trusts in similar contexts at similar time periods and showing that either the the terms were very different or the returns were very different because of a, a different underlying intent. And 
my second comment surrounds a, a piece I shamelessly flogged in the comments earlier about the chronic uncertainty of American Indian property rights, as my tribal co-author deems his tribe American Indians. Um, and I see that as making an argument that the quantifiable losses that you can probably get at, and I'm rostered in finance, so fiduciary doesn't scare me. It usually means quantifiable traceable amounts associated with something we want to identify. And so to me, that's very cool. But I still think there's an important argument to be made that the quantifiable losses should be taken as a floor. Hmm. Because the argument we make in that piece is that naturally, anyone who wanted to invest economically on the frontier, given the shifting, if not outright expropriative and repressive treatment of Native American institutions, that no one in their right mind would park money on res, given the comparable opportunities under more certain institutional terms available to settlers. Identifying or quantifying that effect, to me, is impossible but it's an argument still worth making because it implies that the quantifiable losses should be taken as a floor. Yeah. Finally, I was very curious in, in, in your discussion, you mentioned except on the part of Native American tribes at various points in time. And this gets at the agency question that was rightly raised in the comments. I would just be I would welcome your better informed thoughts as to how you can construe acceptance over such a long time period, especially when oppression seems to be the motive underlying a lot of the nominal treaties. And as somebody who's legally trained, I do think that the law has a good understanding of construing forced acceptance to contract and using a variety of contextual factors to say, this is not true acceptance. This was actually coerced acceptance and therefore is not a legitimate bargain. But I suspect that your context sheds a lot of light on that exact question. But mm. thank you. Sounds very interesting. Mm. You were saying forced acceptance to like the trusteeship paradigm itself. Or just different. You mentioned it at different periods, like they reluctantly accepted the sale of their lands. Right, right, right. Yeah. And and yeah. to me, in my head, I'm like, against what alternative? The likelihood right. that they'd be yeah. taken from them violently. And yeah. so it, it, that's not acceptance or to my uninformed eye. I don't even know how to parse acceptance at that at, at, over right. something so right. sensitive so right. long ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I think and and yeah, I, I think the coercion and and you know coerced treaties i think is like something that's that's you know i think we we definitely discuss treaties in 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 that sense and in, in a historical sense i do think that it is a little bit interesting to think about the longer and this is sort of getting at one of the things that sarah was interested in and kind of the the legacy of um this fiduciary model into the present because the federal government was so successful at insinuating itself as a trustee so that it's now become this paradigm of um of uh federal indian law that is the kind of mode through which native nations have access to historical treaty rights so you know in the early 20th century as the federal government tried to kind of uh, kind of in its own way put an end to the kind of bloodletting period of allotment um, through things like the Indian Reorganization Act, trusteeship became really tied up with federal recognition, became the only way that Native nations can put land back, uh, you know, can kind of claim land back as sovereign territory. So there's this interesting, and I'm not, I, I kind of recognize that this was not exactly the question that you were asking, but there's this interesting, I've you know, been rightly put in place by Native people today who say, you know, you can't just come out swinging against the federal trust responsibility because it is actually in a really important kind of bare minimum um, of obligation that the federal government, that is really key for, um, you know, having services on reservations, everything from having just even having recognition of Native tribal governments, right? So, so that's something that I'm, I think is a really kind of complex, I mean, I, I, I am very critical of the trust system, but I also do recognize that it has been, it, federal government was so successful in establishing that as its mode of relating as, you know, it, through this kind of sovereign to sovereign model that um, it's important to kind of recognize 
um, it's, it's ongoing importance for Native nations. So um, kind of backtracking here, I, I you know, um, I'm, I'm very excited to delve more into the paper and to, you know, there's the kind of question of the quantifiable losses through um, things like trusteeship. I mean, I kind of glanced on the, the kind of corruption element, but I, I think you're right, too, that it is, it's obviously um, a deterring factor for capital formation, particularly on reservation economies. Um, and there was a question I saw kind of in the chat, and I think that that, you know, you can think of the ways that federal trusteeship really inhibited the options that were available for Native nations to be able to have economic development and gaming, obviously, um, which has always been a way of creating a tax system, right? The United States did it um, with, with their own systems of gambling in the early republic, Um is a way of creating a revenue system when you don't have a lot of options in terms of exercising the sovereign right to tax. <laughs> and um, you have, uh, you know, these kind of structural inhibitions on capital formation that are put in place by this trust system and by not actually having, you know, full title to your property. Um, I know Randall Aki has done some work on kind of trying to calculate whether trust lands have been a deterrence. Um, so I, I, I would love to hear about more of that work. Um, and then, yeah, this question about, you know, how to think differently about the relationship between kind of governance and trusteeship. I mean, it's true, right? It's even in the 19th century, I mean, it's such a Anglo, the Anglo legal regime loves trust so much, right? It's such an important building block of, um, kind of property. And so you see, you know, um, uh, legislators talking the 19th century congressmen, you know, talking about the their their role as trust and placing different, you know, kind of wealth in trust um, in a kind of loose metaphorical sense. Um, and then I think you can also I've had people kind of draw comparisons with my work to to sovereign wealth funds, right? Thinking about um, you know the kind of investment uh, these these large like investment funds as as a source of national revenue. But I, where I think it's important to keep in mind is this this sort of um, alienation, right? Like the native nations are not actually their own trustees. And I think that that's what makes it different than some of these other models where it's not just about, um, using, uh, trust as a kind of vehicle of, of collect of pooling wealth and sort of placing someone in trust with it voluntarily. It's actually a way to, um, Sarah, I love the way you put it, um, to have, you know, your wartime enemy have your money. So, um, that's the one kind of, um, I think, difference in in terms of thinking about something like the state trust lands, which is you know more about having the federal government um, as earmark wealth for a specific purpose. In this case, education. So thank you for that. It was great. Uh, Lee Austin had a question he wanted to uh, ask. It's a question slash uh, comment. Um, so it sounds like a fascinating book. Um, like uh, Eric, I'm not afraid of num numbers. We're economists, some of us. Um, so that's what we do. Um, so I, I like it that you're quantifying these things. And I was thinking of whether you could compartmentalize your case studies into three. Um, the first, which might be the null set. Uh, that is, were any of these treaties slash trust relationships good faith and then followed through. That'd be cell number one, and that, that could be zero. Uh, and then cell number two could be good faith and subsequently reneged. And I was thinking of your description of the um, canal bonds. Um, I mean, the default of the canal bonds brought down the state of Indiana. They had to rewrite their constitution. They went bankrupt. They didn't pay the British. The US didn't assume their debt. It was the biggest hit uh, it was the first uh, state that ever defaulted on their debt uh, completely. Some states have defaulted on certain aspects of it. So that could have been good faith if you'd have been given, let's say, Erie Canal bonds in the early part of the 19th century, it'd have been a bonanza. Um, so I didn't know if some of this reneging was, you know, just accident, you know, stuff happens, um, but negotiated in good faith. And it may not be the case. And then, and again, Eric's point was a good one. A lot of these were coerced acceptance. So that was certainly the case of the, the Cherokees and some of their land where ranchers wanted to buy a bunch of land from the Cherokees. U.S. government stepped in, prevented the sale, forced the Cherokees to sell them their land at a, at a price about a tenth of what the ranchers were willing to pay the Cherokees. 
Um, but then the third cell, I think, is the one that, that's the most interesting, is to what extent it was both ex ante fraud and then ex post more fraud and more reneging. Um, and those obviously be the more egregious cases. So, you know, you, you might have a continuum is what I was thinking of from, you know, boy, they got screwed to they got really screwed and they got really, really screwed. Um, it would just be interesting to see whether that follows any temporal dimension. So was this increasingly the case over time or was it relatively random depending on, and was there a North South dimension? Um, you know, just more geography. Uh, and certainly what was going on in the West was, was very different uh, at first um, before it was, you know, part of the U S and then the treaties that the uh, U S uh, reneged on in California in particular. So I was just thinking uh, as one looking at it from the outside, how should I view these different case studies that you have? Can I put them into certain boxes or not? I think that it would be important to think about, you know, really to, to separate the actor at the federal level and the state. Right. So even just starting yeah. with your example about California. Right. I mean, it's the federal government negotiated treaties and then went back and there was so much contention within Congress that those treaties were never even ratified. Right. So there's not even that they quite reneged on them. Um, but I read that time period as a moment where settlers had already kind of gotten ahead of the federal government and there had been so much. And at the state level, there had been this, you know, um, genocidal campaign. So I, I almost the the the, the uh, the factor that I think is important is, is paying attention to the state's kind of capacity to try to dictate the terms of how Indian affairs is going to play out. And that is a, it fluctuates a lot. I mean, it depends on, um, you know, uh, the amount of territory it purports to control. It depends on um, its military um, capacity and military funding. Um, and that's why the Civil War is a really important pivot, um, because that really allows this escalation of federal capacity. But then so the federal government's willingness to outright renege on its treaties is, is, is very much connected to that sort of question of capacity and power and um, the power of the native polities that it's dealing with at the same time. And then the the financial failure of the states um, is, a, is a connected but sort of separate issue, right? So like the, the states, as you point out, Indiana, but even other states, Mississippi, um, there weren't, it didn't happen to be any Indian trust funds invested in Mississippi, but Mississippi outright repudiated its debts altogether. And as you point out, the British uh, were also not paid by Indiana, but they did end up taking, uh, seizing possession of the Wabash and Erie Canal. Um, so there's a lot of complicated things that are happening with the states and um, their own financial crisis. What I do think is interesting is that in that moment in the 1840s where you would expect the federal government to, you know, kind of wa make, wash their hands of it and kind of leave Native nations holding the bag, federal government actually still sees itself as um, kind of you know, for uh, in, in its words, in the words of its officials, um, so afraid of the kind of security implications and the, um, the, the threat of pan-Indian war that it's willing to continue to pay. So I guess the reason is, I think it, it sounds so much like a history. It's very messy, but I do think that <laughs> it's very complicated, but I do think that it is just so specific to the circumstances and these specific relationships that the federal government is having with Native. And I do try to kind of pay attention to a little bit the sort of bursts of federal capacity, um, which are tied, of course, to, you know, economic. So after the depression that was in part kind of compounded by a state bond crisis, you know, in the 1840s, there is a big federal retrenchment, right? And that affects the kind of terms of the treaties is negotiating with Native nations. Um, but there's a lot of moving parts. And, um, and I, I, you know, I very much take your point, your broader point that, you know, to kind of think a little bit more about how these different levels are interacting and whether it's that the states are failing to deliver interest payments or the federal government is, fa is failing to meet the terms of its agreement. But um, Eric's point still holds, right, that from the outset, these 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 treaties can't be read as sort of free, freely consenting transactions, right? That's not what they were. Um, they were, um, you know, these these 
uh, the kind of best of a really brutal set of options for Native nations, and and they were very much these compelled kind of agreements. Yeah, no, I think th that was very helpful. What you just said to me that okay, that I I hadn't thought through as much the relationship between the state and the federal government, a and so you've got one set of actors who may be acting in good faith and another set of actors who are supposed to deliver and have a constituency that really wants to expropriate more and more land for their settlers. Mm -hmm. And so even though the federal government may have been acting in good faith or maybe not, um, it would actually be interesting to look at some of the treaty negotiations and to what extent senators in particular senators, I would say, were involved in those negotiations from those states and to mm -hmm. what extent they were relatively disinterested parties, let's say from Massachusetts or something, negotiating treaties for you know, people in Indiana. So you, you've got these different agency issues going on. Um, so you've got the state acting, but you also have their state representatives at the federal level that, that could be on these various negotiation panels. So knowing the nitty gritty, this would be very messy, but knowing who was doing the negotiating and you mm -hmm. don't have that many tribes, um, I think that would be, for me, that'd be really fascinating because it would bring highlight this state federal uh, tension, I think. Yeah, and there's many instances where this, at the state level, you know, Georgia is the biggest, kind of best clearest case right i mean georgia yeah. is very much pushing for rapid brutal removal they form essentially a vigilante police to just terrorize the cherokee and the federal government is you know they are trying to maintain their program is not not dispossessing native people but it's doing it in a way that is going to cost the least amount of money because they ultimately have to foot the bill so they don't want to have you know there, there's a sense of trying to kind of impose uh uh, order and try to use uh, the treaty process and pay annuities, not because they're good guys, but because they think that, uh, you know, a sort of outright military conflict is just going to be more expensive. Um, so that's a tension that comes up a lot in these moments of, you know, sort of heightened pressure from the state level to try to escalate dispossession. Okay. Um, any other questions from our dwindling group now? We only have a few people left. I, I, I told people 2.30, but we would stay if there were more questions. And, and we've gone uh, to about 2.50 now. Uh, if there aren't any more questions, I think thank Emily for um, presenting her book manuscript today. And I thank, thank you, Jeff. Paul Freiberg. Yeah, thanks so much to the commentators. And I, I have to just say again that um, – this was just extremely helpful, and I really appreciate um, all the the um, comments and, and your in invitation, Jeff. So Absolutely, no, I got good. Uh, trying to remember now who it was, um, Ariel, Ariel Ron, Ariel Ron, who suggested you, right? <laughs> uh, so uh, I'm I'm pleased that uh, I was able to get you through him. So. Uh, thanks to uh, Sarah, who's still here. Paul had to just leave, uh, take care of his two quarantined kids, kids. Thanks to the Alstons, who are closing up the bar here tonight, uh, like they probably have done in the past. <laughs> and uh, thanks to uh, Ann Johnson, who's still around here at the Bedrosian Center. Um, this, will, uh, this will all be um, available on YouTube and probably in the next week or so. Uh, and I'll send out alerts to people when, when it's available. Uh, um, and I guess if there are no more thoughts or comments, then we'll, uh, we'll end our Tuesday afternoon, at least it's still afternoon for me, um, early evening for some of you, perhaps. Thanks again, everyone.